So welcome to the February uh, monthly meeting. Thank you all for, for joining us. Um, the usual sort of housekeeping to begin with, this is, this is intended to be a pretty interactive, you know, not overly formal meeting. So please participate, you know, uh, you know wave a hand or, or just speak up. There's a, a small enough group of us today, I think that uh, we can freely talk. Um, we also, we have a, a Slack channel that uh, I think by now most people are pretty aware of, a Slack workspace that we can uh, also use for communicating. Um, and uh, as you <laughs> notice, we're recording the session so we'll uh, so that we can post the uh, video and slides on the web page afterwards. Uh, which means, I guess, if you prefer not to be recorded, just, you know, switch off switch off camera and I guess uh, <laughs> don't say too much <laughs> or use use the chat or the uh, the Slack instead. Um, so for agenda for today, we'll go through our normal pattern. Uh, we'll start out looking at uh, or, or hearing stories of uh, Win of the Month and Today I Learned. Uh, we have a, a few announcements and then we'll go into our topic of the day. And I see uh, Hannes is uh, with us now and he'll walk us through uh, some things about NERSC's documentation. Uh, then we'll finish off with a bit of a look ahead and a quick look at the numbers for last month. So our first item is win of the month. This is an opportunity to show off an achievement, shout out somebody else's achievement. Uh, it can be bigger, it can be small, or just something that makes you feel good. That, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that has happened in the last month, but yeah, interesting for the rest of us to hear as well. Yeah, things like had a paper accepted or, or saw something challenging. Uh, anybody like to kick us off with something? Seen a, a few uh, successes come come through from ticket system with uh, yeah, people setting up uh, yeah, workflows and multiple you know uh, yeah, GNU parallel on top of Slurm. People are uh, doing good things and getting results, which is nice to see. Maybe we'll uh, jump across to or, or combine this with the. Uh, Sort of the flip side of that, which is uh, uh, today I learned. Um, <laughs> this is a, a good time to talk about also, you know, well, things that things that you learned because you stumbled across them and and uh, interesting for other users, but also things that are challenging and difficult. Something you got stuck on, particularly. I mean, if you if you found a solution, that's uh, that's a, a great thing to share. Um, yeah, or if you didn't and you're looking for a solution, you know, bounce ideas uh, around. Um, other you know, tips about using NERSC that uh, can help other users? Or an interesting presentation that you saw? It's been a it's been a quiet month, I guess. I guess we'll uh, go on to some uh, uh, tips and and things to learn fairly soon when we come to our topic of the day. I also wanted to uh, point out uh, since since we're talking about today, I learned. Um, I uh, occasionally bump into this bug uh, 
um, when using Anaconda. Um, and it's the, uh, the linker that Anaconda puts in your path. So um, every now and then, um, I don't know if it's a version change in Anaconda or something, it might say things like, oh, I can't build MPI for Pi. And it, and it shows a path to a linker there that's clearly in the Conda directory. Um, and uh, the, the lesson there is if you see that uh, one way to um, solve that problem, what well, it's more of a hack really is to uh, move it to a separate location so that uh, the system uses the, the uh, linker that's in the normal system path instead. I thought I'd bring this up here because it, this problem uh, goes away and then reappears every now and then. Interesting, yeah. So that could uh, yeah could solve a few things. And I guess we'll uh, we'll see about this soon. But do we have a, a tip on that in our docs already? We used to. <laughs> I think we <laughs> removed it because because Conda fixed it. <clears throat> But then, but but then I ran into this bug like yesterday when building an image, <laughs> so gonna have to figure out if if I was doing it wrong or or if it's um, like a different channel in Conda brings it back or something like that. Interesting. So so sort of a a, a different uh, I guess it's Python rather than Conda thing that uh, I learned. I guess in a way it counts as a, a, a little bit of a win. This, this was sort of a, a month ago, really, um, maybe even earlier, uh, was about Python VNs, virtual latents, which I hadn't used before. And the, the context was I was trying to get uh, spec to use a particular version of Python and not have that either interfere with the version of Python that was being used for other things or, you know, not pick up. The, the version of Python that was being used for other things because um, you know, it, it has sort of certain requirements for its own dependencies. And, and somebody took me off to, uh, you can set up a VM and put the dependencies you need in that VM and then, yeah, basically point it to use that and it can sort of do it in its own standalone way and not interfere with other things. And you know, it, it worked great. You can basically make a little directory declare it as a, a virtual end uh, install things into that virtual end and, you, and then you've got this sort of little uh, self-contained Python that doesn't interfere with the other Pythons you're using in the same environment. So it's I suspect that's this. Go on. Sorry. Oh, no, uh, go ahead, Don Lai. Oh, yeah. I, I was wondering whether that was, you know, with the v Vint as well as the M4PI, was that uh, something didn't do quite well from the Conda design perspective, or it's just the interactions between uh, some of the Conda designs and uh, the packages designs? Or is that the installation part? Is that we install that as external package or internal inside uh, uh, Anaconda? Under what condition that occurs? Because I, I do run into this, but it doesn't happen all the time. So I didn't not quite understand the, the under what condition it occurs. Right, they're picking up the different um, LD inside Conda. Uh, so I actually don't know either. I suspect it's something to do with the order that the paths uh, appear in the environment. Do you know, Johannes? Yeah, so, well, <clears throat> sometimes, sometimes Conda uh, libraries, um, this is historical reasons, use our path linking, uh, which overrides the uh, LD library path. So that, that's, that's historically one of the biggest problems. They've actually worked on moving away from that design pattern because the linker, uh, um, I guess, uh, what is it, elf symbol type, uh, run path rather than our path um, defers to the local LD library path. Uh, th that's to say um, the new way to do it is uh, to use um, a, a system that doesn't clobber your settings. So there's that. So there's, there's still some old bits in Conda that, that use that kind of linkage. Um, 
And, and the other thing that is uh, worth pointing out is you have something like a Conda site configuration. It's your .conda RC file. And that will, like, let's say you have a script that says Conda install, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you, you might still have a Conda RC file in your home directory that will override, for example, your channel preferences. So that can interfere with the versions that Conda downloads, which in turn can result in uh, incompatibilities. Um, I've also encountered that recently. Um, it was one of those bugs where you import a package and it just seg faults on you. And it turns out that that package assumed that uh, you had a dependency from a different Conda channel. Even though, like, you know, from your perspective, what you're saying is install this thing and its dependencies and everything like that looks normal. In reality, because of your site configuration, you are downloading slightly different versions and that caused these bugs. So I, I'm going to say, like, those are probably the two main reasons why, um, why things can be brittle uh, when using uh, Conda to manage your environment. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't use Conda, by the way. I'm just saying that- um, No, no, no. I, 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 I noticed that there's quite a few, you know, subtle things. And, it, and by the way, I don't know whether there is a good uh, uh, things to follow for Conda. There's just so many different options and yeah. a lot of them are hidden. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so you don't know exactly. You don't even know how to find it out. I, I learn new things uh, all the time. <laughs> yeah. There is um, no central place you can check. Oh, okay. Where is my configuration of what this? Or what I'm using? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was uh, I was helping a user. Um, they had an install script, um, <clears throat> and I was installing everything. It worked fine, and they were installing something and it crashed. And then in this case, it turned out that they had a conda a C file, um, and I hadn't no, had no idea to look for it because you also have the conda init script that lands in your bash RC file. So that's what I looked for, but so yeah. It does seem to be a challenge with any complex package, isn't it? Is, yeah, where, where is the configuration coming from? Why is this package doing this? Yeah. Having a, a easy way to discover that. Um, I think would be a, a really helpful feature for a lot of things. Yeah, if someone here knows a tool that I can just like run and it says, you know, I on this in this environment, I'm configured fig like this, um, like mm -hmm. similar to like Python n site, and it and it tells you these are all the paths I know, and, and, and these are the environment variables that influence those. Um, if, if we had something like that for, for like Conda, that would be brilliant. Uh, that would make diagnosing these things so much faster. Mm, that would be a nice tool. Uh, oh, there's a comment in the chat here. I think the VS Code remote SSH with shifter work away. Oh, yes, I, I remember. Uh, Oliver, you, you asked me to do this uh, before, right? No, I, I promised I would write it up, which I now did ah. this GitHub issue. But if there's wider interest, we could put it on the official docs. It's still a bit involved, but until Microsoft does an official solution, it, it might actually be quite handy for a lot of users. Um, yeah, actually, um, well, we're gonna we're gonna be talking about this. <laughs> um, this uh, I think in this uh, later on in this webinar. So I think this is a, a, a interesting point to bring up. And just thought as the, uh, that the topping was like contributing to nurse docs. Yeah. So. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not aware of the background of this one, but it, uh, it does sound quite relevant, might uh, circle back around to it when we're in the, the topic of the day. I see Daniel's comment about like Conda Info. And actually, I, I like that, um, what do you call it, convention of being able to type something info and finding out kind of just an overview of where you are and what you're doing. It was, it was one of the things that, that I, I, I quite liked in Subversion that uh, I wished that Git had and uh, actually set up my own little uh, alias for that to, to kind of do something kind of equivalent as a, a, like a, a collection of different git commands that show useful things all at once yeah i um thank you daniel for bringing that up um yeah conda info already exists and um i think that that um i 
I forgot, I actually forgot about it. Now that I see its output, I remember it. <laughs> but um, yeah, actually, I think that that's, do we already have that on our um, documentation page, Daniel? I might end up just looking for it. Uh, that might, yeah. Yeah, one to one to explore around for uh, in the near future. So yeah, that was the, that was quite an interesting discussion around around uh, Python and, and related tools. Thank you all. Um, so we have a, a few announcements and and CFPs coming up. Probably the big one is there's a, a Cori OS upgrade uh, coming soon. So that's uh, that's scheduled for the March maintenance. So that'll be sort of about in about you know, one month's time. In fact, um, you've probably seen some emails about this. It's a it's a it's a necessary upgrade, uh, and it changes a few things kind of underneath in the in the Linux system. That means that. You know, a lot of things will just continue to work. Some may not. And in particular, uh, I think there's a new version of glibc, so we'll need to relink things. The things that are dynamically linked kind of get this order magically, so, so you shouldn't need to do very much. And that's you know, been the default now for a, for a little while on Cori. But particularly if you're using statically linked codes, you'll need to at least relink them. And you know, for a lot of things, it's probably a good excuse to rebuild them with newer compilers, newer libraries, and so on like that. Um, another one, looks like I missed the bolding on this. Um, summer internship time is not quite upon us yet, but the, the point in the process where interns are applying for positions and, and organizations like NERSC are looking for interns is upon us. And NERSC actually has a whole bunch of projects listed on uh, this web page here. Um, yeah, as proposed intern projects that we're looking looking for summer interns to come and join with. So, if you are or have or know a uh, a student who's looking for a summer internship, uh, point them our way. It'd be yeah, yeah, great to get them on board. Um, there's a couple of uh, training and sort of workshops coming up. So in about a week's time, uh, there's an NVIDIA performance tools for A100, so that's our GPU on Perlmutter uh, training. So it's February 23rd, which is right about this time next week. Um, we have an introduction to programming with Sickle on Perlmutter and beyond on March the 1st. And uh, not so much hosted by NERSC, but, but uh, that we are aware of, then these tend to be interesting. There's an ideas ECP webinar on software design patterns in research software uh, coming up early in March. So the ECP uh, ideas project has a whole lot of really interesting webinars with great sort of tips and tricks and uh, you know best practices. That's the ones that I know about. Uh, are there any other announcements and calls for, for participation in conferences and events coming up that uh, others here know about and would like to uh, announce or publicize. Sounds like no, so we can uh, move along to our topic of the day, which is uh, how do you use and contribute to nurse documentation for users, uh, which uh, Johannes will lead us through. Would you like to share a screen and do a walk through that way? Johannes? Oh, I was fighting with the mute button. Yes. Um, yep. All right, let's, let's share. So this is um, supposed to be a really quick, uh, walk through and um, people please ask questions um, when something isn't clear. Um, so uh, I think as a good starting point, um, let, let's, uh, let's look at our 
Uh, oh, first of all, do you see my my screen? Yes, it's looking good. Um, okay, and I also realized that maybe my turn <laughs> was a bit small, so um, <laughs> I've just uh, zoomed it uh, zoomed in a little bit. All right, so maybe um, maybe another step up is worthwhile on the zoom on the terminal. Oh, oh, I see. Um, yeah. So is that good? Uh, that's okay for me, actually. Everybody else? Um, Looks good. Yeah, uh, I don't hear any complaints. So, um, yeah, so um, if, if we looked at our um, documentation, uh, the root of our documentation, you um, basically would be greeted with this um, screen. And um, there's actually a, now a new. Uh, page, a new top level page called contributed tips uh, and tricks. Um, and if you go there, you are actually um, sort of pointed at um, this, this page is sort of the, the beginnings of, of uh, maybe, maybe almost like a little stub for um, uh, contributions. Um, and we, we link here also the um, the, the instructions for contributing to the um, documentation GitLab repo. And I, and I think this is always a good place to um, start for anyone who wants to start contributing. So um, all of these pages are hosted on GitLab. Um, if I just follow this link here on a separate tab, you actually can see the GitLab repository. Um, the repository, it's, oops, excuse me. The, repository um, is based on make docs and it's publicly accessible. Um, so in the contribution guide, you can see there, we, we actually have a lot of uh, information already and it broadly falls into, um, so the, I would say two categories. Um, the first one is how to actually make contributions. Um, and since, this, uh, since we use GitLab, um, the recommended workflow for anyone who isn't uh, part of the NERSC organization um, would be to create a fork of this repo, work within that fork, and then submit a merge request. Um, and this page actually gives you all the details. So if you um, if you miss something that I'm saying now, uh, don't worry. You can always look it up again, and, and this page is findable. Um, but also, you, uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, the second uh, area which I like down here is so up here it, it talked about the git workflow and then down here um, it mentions um, just you know the common issues that you might have uh, when writing the markdown format for the, the documentations page so for example how to make a link with relative path and absolute uh, well don't use <laughs> but yeah how to, how to create a linking using relative paths how to include code, um, those sort of things. Um, now, let, I, I thought it might be nice just to, to show you how this works um, uh, in action. So I'm risking a live demo now. Um, it's probably gonna fail, but, but I thought it might still be uh, instructive. So the first thing that you um, might end up doing is you might want to create a fork of this uh, repo. So let's go to the top level of the uh, docs repo. And um, I've actually not created a fork uh, of this so far. So here we go. I'm forking it now. I don't need to do any. Oops. Oh, yeah. So it's actually, oh, yeah. So um, if you're a member of several organizations, you might want to um, select your own private uh, repo. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, and in a moment, you will have um, your GitLab repo. Okay, so I'm gonna clone this to my laptop now. So, it, it um, doesn't take all that long. Um, so I thought it would be good for everyone to see it uh, from the very beginning. All right. 
So now that we have it locally, um, here's our repo. The first thing that, that you might want to do is um, create a, um, a way for you to be able to synchronize your local fork with um, the uh, main fork uh, that, that actually is part of our documentation. So the first thing what we want to do is uh, we want to go git remote add upstream. And of course, you need to know the URL of the upstream repo. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to go and, oops, this is still my, my one. Uh, yeah, this is the right one. I'm going to add this one. OK, so now if, if I went get remote, oops, remote minus V, it shows you that uh, the origin of this local copy is um, my personal fork. And then I have an upstream uh, remote that is the, the upstream GitLab. So you would, for, for instance, say git pull upstream main. And that uh, will get you the, the latest version that, that we are currently having in production uh, at NERSC. Um, it's always helpful to do this before you start making uh, a merge request. So just make sure that your merge request is based on the latest version. All right. The next thing is you might want to prototype locally. That's pretty easy too, because we have um, a requirements text. So you can go pip install oops, minus, minus r requirements. And that will um, go through and try and find Okay, so I mean, I had most of these things installed already, but but you would probably see um, some things being installed. And now you actually have all the tools that you need to actually build the documentation locally. So if you uh, look at, um, I wonder if the readme actually says this, but um, I'm just gonna tell you now, um, if you run the make docs command, it, it gives you several options. One is to build the documentation and then uh, serve will, um, so, uh, will, will, will host it locally. So first thing we wanna do is make docs build and that, um, that might take a second. So I'm actually going to uh, do a helpful, a helpful little tangent uh, while this is running. So if I go back to our documentations page, um, there is something neat. Um, well, um, let's say let's say you go to some random page here. Okay, how about desk? And um, you're on the desk page, and you find that you want to make an edit here, but you think, well, if I look at the the repo, where is this file? And so the easiest way to find out where this particular uh, file is located in, in, on GitLab is to click on this gray pencil or pen icon up here. And it will actually redirect you to the uh, markdown file that, that that page was rendered from. Um, and so you can see the path is docs, analytics, desk, or MD. And, and GitLab shows you its own impression of how, how this is rendered, but um, uh, let's, let's go back to our build. Okay, so it built our documentation now. Now you can actually uh, host it locally by going mk docs serve. Um, this should be uh, a bit faster, I hope. Um, and once this is done, it will present us with a uh, localhost URL that we can actually navigate to. Um, let's, okay, so it doesn't actually take this, it isn't that much faster. Maybe I imagined that. Um, in a few seconds, it will be done though. Any questions so far, by the way? I suspect that Serve is doing a a rebuild. Yeah, I was hoping that Surf would be, uh, would know what's been built already. All right, so um, okay, it was maybe a tiny bit faster, ten percent faster. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, 
All right, so um, uh, so so that's nice. Um, now we have a URL that, that I can just follow here. And that is now a local version. Um, so let's say you want to make a change. Um, and a really quick change that I can already um, and that I already noticed here is maybe I want this here to not say contributed tips and tricks, but contributor tips and tricks. I'm not saying that we actually want to put the, this into production, but um, I don't know, maybe I'm nitpicking, but maybe I want to change this, um, this title. This also uh, indicates another uh, aspect of MacDocs. I haven't actually tried this change, so this is really uh, going to be, uh, what is it, uh, live, uh, live production. Uh, so I'm just going to go and open a new terminal here. Excuse me. Whoa, this is, this is hard. I'm not used to working at this uh, resolution. There we go. Uh, so let's go back to our um, repo. Okay, there's actually one thing that you might need to uh, keep in mind, and that is um, these things here, these menu items, they are actually defined in a YAML file. So let's go and edit this YAML file. It's this make docs YAML. And uh, let's search for it, MK, no, no, contribute, contribute tips and tricks. Okay. So let's say I want to make the change here, contribute or tips and tricks. I think MacDocs actually notices that um, a file has changed and it's actually uh, now rebuilding. So once that's done, we should be able to preview our change in the live version. Um, and after that, you might realize that you've sort of uh, diverged from the recommended workflow that we suggest. Um, if I go to our, oops, I don't have it open anymore. Let's go back to this page. Um, where is it? Da, 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 da. Here we go. So we recommend the workflow that you actually place your changes into a branch. So I will show you how to do that next. Um, let's see if it's finished. Okay, it's done. It's done uh, rebuilding. So I should just be able to refresh the page. Oh yeah, and it already says contribute to tips and tricks. Um, all right, and, and, and the same goes for, for other changes. If you went uh, and, and changed the file now that your uh, MacDoc server is running, it will detect those changes uh, and rebuild MacDocs um, every time uh, to give you a local preview. When you are happy with this local preview, what you need to do is you need to somehow tell us that you would like to make this change. Um, and the way that I recommend you do it is um, first of all, you, you um, let's have a look where we are. Well, we are on the main branch. So first of all, I recommend that you go git checkout minus B and then a name for your branch. So let's go JPB. I always like to append my initials, but that's just, it's not necessary. Uh, menu change. Now I'm in the menu change branch. I can now go we look at what files have changed. Yes, this is the file I want to add. By the way, if you, here's a little Git trick. If you don't, if you want to add all changed files and you don't want to go and type in the file names of all the files that have changed, just go add dash minus U. So those are all the updated files. Git commit, suggest this section. Um, okay, that's still not enough to actually tell us. So now you want to go git push. Ah, but the thing is, uh, this branch doesn't exist on your local GitLab. So let's push it. Let's just follow this git instruction here. This will make the, put the change in origin. And by the way, if you go git remote minus V, you see that origin is your version. So, so there's no harm in actually pushing it this location. 
And there it is. Now, if you went back to your uh, to the GitLab page that corresponds to your local GitLab repository, it's not that one. Uh, have I navigated my, myself uh, away? Yeah, I kind of did. Oh, well. Ah, but the nice thing is um, when you logged into GitLab, um, it notices that your um, you have uh, made a change to your local uh, branch. So, to, uh, so you've made a change to a branch in your local fork, um, right? So, and it's it's saying, well, this is a forked repo. So, so do you want to actually create a merge request? So, it actually recommends it um, as sort of a tooltip here. So now go here, and then you would, for instance, um, uh, fill in a title and a description here. Um, there is a template. Uh, oops. Uh, Steve, do you know uh, why why the template isn't showing up here? Have I made have I done something wrong? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we we actually have some yeah. Template. This is. Uh, hang on. Is this because the merge request is actually coming from your fork and not from the nurse center? Uh, it could be that the template is in nurse.gitlog.io, but not in the fork, which is interesting and a little bit surprising, actually. Yeah, I would have thought that it inherits the, the templates. Um, I, I, at this point, for the sake of, of gravity, I would say that we, we want to make, uh, we have some templates for these things. I, I can't find them right now, um, but um, I'm gonna move on. And at some point those templates might uh, appear here um, and, and I'll revisit it if we have a moment at the end um, because there's still two more things I want to uh, talk about. Um, oh, and, hang on, I just saw something. Oh no, this is... Uh, this is not it. Oh, yeah, and no, this is all still. Ah, this is not in this merge request. I think this is all in your local, or like all, all happening in your fork, right? Am um, I in the wrong change? Uh, I was going to say, if you change branches, go back into that merge request and change branches. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Yeah, okay. Now, if you change that target branch to the upstream. Um, Here we go. Ah, okay. Source target. Yeah. Um, just in case you missed it, um, I definitely missed it. Uh, so I'm just gonna go back to, okay. So so this is the, the um, I'm just gonna go to the very, okay. This is the place where we wanted to click on, i.e. Um, where we are um, prompted to create a merge request. That, that's very well spotted, thank you. And actually the, the default settings for the merge request um, go from your branch in your fork to the main in your fork. So let's change that. So you can see here the source branch, it's, the, it's this repo, target branch, it's that repo, same repo. Let's go to the repo called nurse. It's down at the bottom here, nurse-gitlab.io. And then we can go compare branches and continue. Ah, there it is, there we go. <laughs> yeah. And it then also uh, fills in this little template um, uh, for your for the text for your merge request. So you suggest that you put a um, descriptive title and then you um, look at, uh, at each of these uh, things that you should check off here. Um, so for example, we know it renders correctly. So you put an X there and I didn't change it. Yeah, okay. I have a question. Yeah. So when you created the clone, it's from the remote upstream, right? Yeah. So why this template is not part of your clone? 
Mm. Uh, I, I suspect what happened is for some reason, Git, uh, GitLab thinks that um, the template, um, sorry, I think two things are happening here. First, the template is not part of the Git repo, but the GitLab project. Oh. So when you created the fork, it seems to only inherit the repository, but it doesn't seem to inherit any artifacts that are part of the uh, larger GitLab project that includes things like CI and stuff like that. If um, you do sub, what's that, recurse uh, some modules, would that include this? Yes. Yeah, so if you've got sub modules, they are part of the GitLab repository. Um, okay. But, and, 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 and if you do Git clone recursive, um, that would actually get your sub modules. But that wouldn't get this thing because this so is not how, a sub-module. If you want this thing in, as part of your clone, how to get this? Oui, uh, it's it's a template in a merge request. So I suspect if you don't have access to the GitLab settings, which you probably don't, oh. um, there, there isn't a good way to get this. Um, someone else who knows uh, the ins and outs of GitLab more than me might be, uh, might, might have a, a better solution, but I recommend that um, you create your own template basically. Okay. In, in you. your own, uh, but actually I think I like it this way because GitLab also seems to uh, use as a target for your merge request, your own main branch and not the uh, main branch of the originating um, repo. And so um, if you don't see this template, then you know that you're not actually about to do a merge request into gitlab.nurse.io, uh, but um, instead, uh, you know. But it's, it's this is on. you. You know that you are expecting this template, right? But yeah. for other users who may not know, so yes. you don't know what you are missing. No, that, that's true. It's absolutely right. That, that's why I'm sort of walking everyone through this so that they can like start to build an expectation of what this should feel like when they want to do it themselves. Okay. Um, and and the, uh, uh, like all the information is available in, the, um, in this contributing.md uh, file. Um, I don't think it, it says to keep a watch out for the, um, uh, um, for, for the template, but it does tell you how to uh, create a merge request. Um, and so um, you, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a workflow that, that um, requires getting used to, but it's not an unusual Git workflow. So um, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, just, just as a, a final, uh, just to, to close out this particular item, um, Things to watch out for are the CI uh, for um, for your um, uh, push for for your commit, and um, can uh, non nurse users assign these? Um, I don't think you can assign uh, assignees or review. You might be able to assign reviewers, um, but if you were to um, uh, committed now. So if you were to create this merge request now, um, it would then be reviewed by nurse staff um, who have the final say on whether to commit it or not. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure if you can on. assign reviewers, but in your description, you can at people. Yes. And, and that will draw their eyes to it. And, and yeah, then, then within nurse, yeah, there's a, a pretty good chance that that person will end up as one of the reviewers. That, yes, um, okay, that, that's a good point. So um, I think, I, I, yeah, have a, have a look at assigning reviewers. Um, that, that is always a way to get attention, but, and just what Steve just said, um, I just, I'll demonstrate it now. If I add, and then for example, I can add Steve Leak. Now this would, at this point, when you hit uh, submit, Steve would get an email. Or, or, and if he's turned it off, he's watching the, his notifications. He'll get notified. And so um, that is the, so if you, for example, um, I've been in the situation before where someone uh, opens a ticket and says, how about changing the documentation? Um, and I recommend that um, they do it themselves. Um, 
this would be really good because then you can point back to that nurse staff member that encouraged you to uh, make this change. They already know what's going on. Um, all right, and, and uh, just um, <clears throat> I think the last point I wanted to make um, about um, editing this, this documentation is, let's say you want to make a um, fairly minor change like this one. Um, now it's been, what I did there was, was pretty involved, right? Like you make a local clone um, and uh, edit a file and preview it locally. So let's, I'm not gonna make this merge request um, because um, you know, I'm not actually that persnickety about titles, um, <clears throat> but let's say we want to do the same thing. Um, or let's, make, let's say we want to make that change to desk. Um, I can find it again. I probably can't. Um, a, a good place to start might be in the actual rendered docs at docs.nurse.gov and use that that edit pencil. Right. Yes, that's a good point. Um, I wonder what happens if I actually do it on my local copy. Ha! It actually still points to. Uh, okay. Yes. So. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say I went there. I forgot where the desk documentation is and, and I'm sort of running out of time. So I want to be fast. So let's say um, we want to make a change to this file. Now you actually have this uh, web IDE um, uh, button. Now this is not available to you if you're not in the nurse organization, but in your own version, on your own fork, you can actually go, remember it's docs, jobs, examples, index, right? So Let's go to, to the same, yeah, docs, jobs, examples, index. So, so this is the same file, but, but it's now the local uh, fork, sorry, the, 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 your own fork rather than nurse's production version. And then you can click on the web IDE <clears throat> and that will open up an IDE for you. You can even preview Markdown by switching the tab up here. This is this is um, uh, GitLab Markdown, not MakeDocs Markdown. So um, there will be differences, but um, uh, so I still recommend for, um, to use the local copy with a preview with MakeDocs for larger changes. But let's say you have a typo here. Uh, I don't know. I actually don't know of any typo, so I'm going to introduce a typo. So let's say I want to remove, there we go. <laughs> so small edit. Um, and if you can, uh, if you then click commit, it'll uh, prompt you for a commit message up here, as well as a branch name. Um, and you can then hit commit here. Uh, that was not very helpful, but it does create a merge request for you automatically which you can then once again, direct to the nurse pages. And you have the same template again. So, so basically now you've seen uh, two approaches. One is a little bit more involved for larger changes. And if you spot a typo of, you know, like, like very quick change to some text, you can always use the web ID. All right, I've been talking for ages. I'm gonna stop now. Um, but any questions? <laughs> All right. So I'll start off by saying thanks for that walkthrough and, and a particular shout out to that little tip at the end about using the web ID because that's a great way to get started. It's uh, yeah, very, what do you call it, kind of low barrier to entry. You can, yeah, if you spot something on the web page, you can basically make an edit there and then yeah, without leaving the web page. And if it's a small uh, edit, um, you know, you don't have to write massive prose in the merge request, right? If it's like a typo, call it fixed typo. So we want to make this easy for everyone. So, so earlier, uh, Oliver uh, posted in the chat about, so he has a, has a tip to add already. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep, 
Yeah, I would highly encourage you to put that in. <laughs> you yeah, can I can, I can, I can, I can just make make a pull request, and then then you guys can figure out where where it should go. Oh, there's one more thing I wanted to say, Steve. Um, you had a location in mind for like where should stuff go that no one really knows exactly where it should go, but we should decide where to put it. Right. So so sometimes it's fairly clear where something should go. Uh, hang on, I should share a screen again. There it is. Actually, let's share a uh, Firefox screen instead. I see it. Okay. So make this a little bit smaller. So sometimes when you've got a tip, it's uh, yeah, it's fairly easy to find where it belongs. So so for instance, if you've got um, an example that you you, you spot uh, something here that's or you know, something that's not here that's useful, this is a good page to add it to. Um, if you've got you know, if you know something about uh, one of these performance tools or you know, have, have some tips for a, for a different one, tips about compilers. The, the search bar can be pretty useful for sort of finding the, the general topic if it's something specific. Um, but if in doubt, and sometimes it's not really obvious where something goes. And so that's kind of the aim of this page is that it's a good place to put something whose location isn't obvious. And this means that you, know, you don't have to worry too hard about where it goes. You can put it here. Um, that gets you know, the, the text of a tip and a, um, you know, a merge request up in front of nurse people who can look at it and go, oh, I know where this should be, or might choose to leave it in tips and tricks, merge it right in there where it is. Um, yeah, to be possibly moved to, to elsewhere on the site later. But so yeah, if in doubt, kind of the, the purpose of this page is to be a, a target for putting things when, uh, yeah, when it's not immediately obvious where they should go. All right, I, I think, yeah, there don't, don't seem to be uh, any more questions. Um, I think the, uh, the, the discussion feature of GitLab is very helpful also to brainstorm some ideas. You know, you might have an idea of what, what to put where, and then other folks um, might have interesting um, suggestions as well. Yeah, the whole sort of GitLab workflow is, is quite nice to work with. If, uh, if you haven't already started uh, doing that in, in your other projects. So yeah, uh, thanks again for, for that, Hannes, and, and Oliver for the um, starting tip to, yeah, to add to the docs. Uh, we are getting close to time. So let's bounce through our last few items. Here we go, back to here. Uh, first of all, coming up, uh, one that uh, maybe next month or maybe the, the, the month after, but I, I suspect this will be interesting to some people, is uh, our annual user survey closed recently and we're looking through the results now and yeah, assembling our, um, our NERSC's annual report that uses, amongst other things, the information that, that we learned in this survey. And uh, yeah, we might do a, a little bit of an overview of some, some themes that we discovered looking through what, uh, what people have replied in the survey. Um, we are also, we had, a, we had a really, really great talk from Koichi last month about the work he's doing and using the, the Q system to optimize his whole throughput, not just the immediate job. Um, and yeah, that, that was sort of yeah, really interesting and prompted some sort of discussion and further you know, collaborations and interactions later. Um, and 
Yeah, I think this is a really good thing to have in these meetings. So if you have something that you'd like to tell us about, uh, or alternatively, if there's a topic you'd like to hear about that you know, you'd just like to you know, propose as a, okay, can we have this as a topic that, that uh, you're not necessarily the one to present, um, let us know about it. So to make it easier to let us know about it, we've got this uh, uh, form up now that you can fill in. It's a, it's a pretty simple form. It's really just a, a place to put your, your ideas and a, and a contact point. So uh, I've just put the link in the chat, click on it and yeah, let us know if you've got uh, something something to present as a topic of the day or, uh, or something that you'd be uh, interested in us discussing. And then a, a quick look at last month's numbers. So we're starting to get uh, Perlmutter numbers in uh, now as well. Um, Perlmutter is still not a production machine. It's still you know, in the process of being uh, installed. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> there will be a bit of movement happening there. Um, but, uh, you yeah, know, Corey numbers, we, uh, yeah, we report back to Department of Energy. So in, oh, I didn't update this title. This is actually January. Uh, so in January, we had one unscheduled outage as well as the unscheduled maintenance that happened around the AY turnover. Uh, we had a, a power failure, yeah, a power unit failure in one of the cabinets. Uh, Perlmutter had, had two scheduled maintenances in January and one very short uh, outage happened near the end of the month. For availability, yeah, I've been kind of exploring some of the different uh, you know, chart tools that we've got for this. And it's, it's a little bit different to see the, you know, the variation, but I think what this does show is that it's very close to 100%. It's up, you know, so last month, Corey Kane on its availability was at you know, 99 and a bit percent. Uh, and then the, uh, that's for the scheduled availability and then the overall availability when you include the times that it was uh, down for scheduled maintenance, it was still up at around sort of 97.7%. Steve, yeah. with the different shade, what does that mean? Uh, I think it's just a feature of this particular graph, like generated graph. Oh, okay. uh, it uses a, a, a graded um, color for the area. To show the percentage range? Yeah. So it's a little hard to see here, but that's 100% down here, and this is 90% okay. down here. So, uh, so I guess what maybe what the shade is useful for is kind of to draw the eye to where the interesting data is. Um, it would it would be interesting if we had a, a you know a great dip in the in the availability that happened somewhere that you know what what would the gradient do there would it go down? Uh, so we have our capability metric, which is that um, you know uh, systems like Cori Nest systems are very you know large uh, cutting edge kind of systems. Um, part of the, the motivation for having these systems is to have a system that can be used for work that just can't be done on a smaller cluster. Um, and yeah, you know, as part of making sure that we're you know, actually achieving that, one of the, the metrics that we report is uh, how many jobs used more than uh, a certain fraction of the machine. So I think our, our number is more than 1,024 nodes on, on Cori. And we, you know, we aim to have something like 25% of the work on Cori being this really large scale, difficult to do anywhere else kind of work. And in December, actually, it was, it was quite high. Nearly 70% of uh, the work on Cori was uh, up and over that threshold. Uh, our open ticket seems to be sitting pretty steadily. The, the incoming rate and the outgoing rate is about the same. So poked up a little bit around the end of January. And that's what we have for today. We're slightly over 12 o'clock. Uh, thank you all for joining us and for sticking around the extra few uh, minutes.